The following video show, organized as a last-minute substitute show by our regular host for this hour, is about USACBI. That is, the U.S. campaign for the academic and cultural boycott of Israel. Some people feel that USACBI is a rampantly anti-Semitic organization. In these times of national controversy about racial and religious bigotry, this show gives us a certain level of concern especially in that it is taking place here in Hawaii. So, while we will allow these individuals to appear on ThinkTech, we advise you that the views they express do not in any way represent the views of ThinkTech or its management or staff. Further, to provide balance, we will be broadcasting a Community Matters show immediately after this show to address anti-Semitism on campus 2017. Please stay tuned to get that side of the story. Aloha, my kako. I'm Will Carone, editor of Summer Summit Magazine, standing in for Kaui Lucas, your regular host of Hawaii is my mainland. Live streamed Fridays at 3 p.m. and available for your viewing anytime on YouTube or for listening via podcast at thinktechhawaii.com. It's been nearly 70 years since the United Nations created the modern state of Israel in the wake of the Holocaust with the intention of providing Jewish refugees with a nation of their own within a historic homeland. While this event has been championed by every U.S. administration since as a great step forward for justice, the reality is far more complicated. The 1948 creation of Israel is known as Al-Nakba, or the catastrophe, by Arabs, as it resulted in the forced expulsion of 750,000 Palestinians, the military occupation of Palestinian land, and the creation of an apartheid system of laws to govern the Palestinians who remain within the occupied Palestinian territories and Israel proper. Nevertheless, U.S. support for Israel has remained unwavering and uncritical. The Israel lobby, one of the most powerful in Washington, has sponsored a bill that would make it illegal for U.S. organizations and citizens to conscientiously boycott Israeli-made products, a form of First Amendment-protected free speech. Hawaii's Congresswoman Colleen Hanabusa is a co-sponsor of the bill, known as the Israel Anti-Boycott Act. My guest today is Jewish American scholar and co-founder of the Hawaii Coalition for Justice in Palestine, Cynthia Franklin, who visited Israel and the OPT in 2013 and who has worked extensively on the U.S. academic and cultural boycott of Israel. Cynthia, thanks for joining me. Thanks for having me on the show. Okay, so the first thing I want to talk about is BDS a little bit. There's a lot of misinformation now about what it is and why it was created. Uh, on the one extreme end, some people call it a terrorist organization. Less extreme, but just as unhelpful, some people say that it's anti-Jewish. Can you fill us in a little bit about what BDS is really all about and how you first got involved? Uh, first, what is BDS? BDS was founded in 2005. It was a call put out by Palestinian civil society, 170 um, organizations and groups, asking that people across the world observe a boycott of um, a boycott, divestment, and sanctions program of Israel until three conditions were met. These three conditions asked that peop, um, were a way of applying nonviolent pressure on Israel to comply with international law. So there are three planks to BDS, and when those are met, there would be no more boycott. Mm -hmm. So the three things are, first of all, to um, end the colonization of all Arab lands and to dismantle the illegal uh, apartheid wall or separation wall. The second condition is to provide equal rights to uh, Arab or Palestinian citizens of Israel who currently exist under um, a set of unequal laws. There are 50 laws that on their face discriminate against Palestinian citizens of Israel. The third condition is to respect and promote the right of return for, the, um, for those Palestinians who have been displaced from historic Palestine. And I think um, those numbers are Seven, over 7 million. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. 
the diaspora, yeah. Mm -hmm. And, and that is a UN protected right and when of you return. And when you say illegal, you're talking about based on UN? Uh, based on UN Resolution 194 mm -hmm. um, has, has stipulated that Palestinians have right of return. And that the settlements and the wall are, are illegal as well. Yes, that yeah. those are illegal. Yeah, mm -hmm. okay, okay. And how did you get involved with uh, BDS? I got involved with BDS as a result of a trip to Palestine in 2013 where I observed for myself conditions that I had read about and learned about. And um, I met up with many Palestinians and what the uniform thing they said was, please go back, tell people what you've seen, and also support the boycott. Mm -hmm. And um, so when I, when I got back, I was invited on to the organizing collective for the U.S. Campaign for the Academic and Cultural Boycott of Israel, also known as U.S. ACFI. Mm -hmm. And so I have joined that uh, organizing collective and been part of that for the last four years or so. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. So in that trip in 2013, right? Mm -hmm. That's correct. You were, you were there for a, um, you were looking for contributing writers for a special edition of, of the journal Biography, which mm -hmm. you co-edited, that, mm -hmm. that's correct. Mm -hmm. And um, what were some of the things that you witnessed there, and how did they either change or solidify your understanding of the Israeli state and uh, what's going on on the ground there? Well, one of the things that I really learned right from before I left for the trip, mm -hmm. uh, before I left for the trip, I was told, you know, make sure your computer doesn't have anything on it that indicates you are going to the West Bank. Make sure there's no contacts in your phone that indicate that you're going to the West Bank um, because you will, you can get in trouble right at the airport and, and meet with obstacles there. So right away, <laughs> I encountered a sense of the kinds of repressions. Mm -hmm. On the way into the West Bank, there's a sign that says, you know, do, you know, if you're, uh, if you're not Palestinian, I don't remember the exact language, but it's basically do not enter, this is dangerous, uh, your life is in danger if you cross into the West Bank. Mm -hmm. So um, I then crossed into the West Bank and met with uh, amazing hospitality. Mm -hmm. But again, right away, um, driving into the West Bank, um, was I was going on roads with potholes and badly maintained and knew there was a separate set of roads for Israelis um, for settlers mm -hmm. who are living in the West Bank. So I immediately observed two sets of roads. Mm -hmm. I uh, very quickly came to understand how to recognize who are settlers, uh, Israeli Jewish settlers, and who are Palestinians by who had water tanks on their roofs because one of the things Israel does is it, it takes the water from the West Bank and keeps about, I think it's 80%, but I'm not totally sure, mm -hmm. and then it sells back the rest of that water and delivers it once a week to those water tanks. So there's a perpetual water shortage. Mm -hmm. I also experienced delays at checkpoints and, um, and, and witnessed violence at checkpoints. Uh, one particularly horrific and memorable experience was seeing a small child run down by, a, by an Israeli settler at a checkpoint. And um, I witnessed and heard about people's difficulties getting to school, difficulties getting to the hospital because of the checkpoints, because of the wall, uh, making mobility very difficult. I talked to students who had themselves been arrested or who had fiancés or friends arrested for things like setting up chairs to, for demonstrations to protest the wall. So I experienced a whole range of um, ways that the occupation affects people's lives in bureaucratic ways, um, in ways that um, endanger them physically, that are just exasperating. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that the most dramatic um, experience I had was in Hebron, mm -hmm. which is a place of really intense repression. Um, it's one of the few places where settlers actually live right basically on top mm -hmm. of Palestinians. Mm -hmm. They've moved into Palestinians' homes and um, we were shown around Hebron by the international temporary presence in Hebron um, who make sure that, made sure that we were kept safe from all the Israeli soldiers who mm -hmm. were pointing their, their guns down at the street. Uh, Palestinians cannot walk on there's, there are streets they cannot walk on. They have to, um, they cannot enter the front doors of their homes. Mm -hmm.
there's netting above uh, the streets. Mm -hmm. Which um, we, we actually have a, a picture of that, of one of the pictures that you brought oh, back yeah, yeah. of the street in Hebron uh, with the net sort of covering that, yeah. And that's to protect from rocks and things that are thrown down, but mm -hmm. the, the people that are the international observers said that people will throw acid down on the street or they will throw um, sewage. Mm -hmm down through those nets and and we observed you know we observed evidence of that mm -hmm. as we were walking through mm -hmm. the streets mm -hmm. so that was the most dramatic thing that we saw but in addition there was just the kind of daily erosion of people's rights and ability to function and the kind of normalization of occupation that really makes life even for the best off Palestinians mm -hmm. quite difficult. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, you know, Hebron is an extreme example, but we were in the homes of quite wealthy people who made us these beautiful meals. But the stories that they told were ones of, you know, losing family and losing friends to violence mm -hmm. um, from the Palestinian. It's, it's basically what you have there is it's under military rule. Mm -hmm. And so even the best off Palestinians still are living under an occupation that is quite brutal and, um, and leaves them with a great deal of uncertainty mm -hmm. about the most basic of things. Mm -hmm. And now you're, you're Jewish American, so, um, and you talk a little bit about in your summit essay about um, sort of the difficulty with um, coming to terms, I suppose, with um, the fact that anti-Zionism is, is not opposed to being Jewish. So, Real quickly, um, could you just share a little bit about that with your experience? Well, that? that's that's such an important thing yeah. to to really underline that being Jewish and being Zionist are two different things. And for me, Zionism is a political, you know, ideology. It's a form of nationalism. It's a form of settler colonialism. And I, as a Jew, want no part of that. I um, work with Jewish Voice for Peace quite actively, and um, I think that they have been very clear-sighted and developing a position that very clearly lays out the fact that being anti-Zionist is not being anti-Jewish. Mm -hmm. The two are, Israel depends upon those two being substitutable mm -hmm. for one another. Mm -hmm. And in fact, the, the U.S. State Department makes those substitutable. You're not allowed to criticize Israel or you are anti-Semitic. That is Israel's most powerful way of keeping its human rights violations in check. And it's one that I think Jews of conscience have a particular responsibility to refuse mm -hmm. and to say that as Jews, we do not need to support Zionism. And this is in no way a reflection on our, we are not self-hating Jews. Mm -hmm. We are not ourselves anti-Semitic. Mm -hmm. We are just against settler colonialism. We are against apartheid. We are against occupation mm -hmm. and not in our name. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so. The situation on the ground um, being what it is and the separation wall doing what it's done to Palestinian land and then on top of that the, the you said 50 laws that are um, different that, that treat Palestinian citizens of Israel differently mm -hmm. um, what does that equal what does all of that sort of equal in terms of like the Israeli state is it, is it an apartheid state would you say um, I think Israel is an apartheid state and um Desmond Tutu is one of the people that supports the, um, the BDS movement, and he has said that apartheid in Israel is worse than it was in South Africa when, it, when South Africa was an apartheid state. And I think one of the things that often is confused is that apartheid is, it's a set of, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a definition uh, that involves separation and discrimination. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to look like it looks in South Africa for it to be apartheid. And so apartheid does look different in Israel and Palestine than it does in South Africa. Some South Africans have said it looks worse. Mm -hmm. okay. But I we think- We have to go to commercial real oh, quick, but okay. we'll be right back. Okay. Planning all week for the day of the big game. Watching at home just doesn't feel the same. What on the list is who's gonna drive? It's nice to know you're gonna get home alive. Plan for fun and responsibility. Choose a DD. Captain of our team. It's the DD. For every game day, 
Assign a designated driver. Hello, I'm Helen Dora Hyden, the host of Voice of the Veteran, seen here live every Thursday afternoon at 1 p.m. on Think Tech Hawaii. As a fellow veteran and veterans advocate with over 23 years experience serving veterans, active duty, and family members, I hope to educate everyone on benefits and accessibility services by inviting professionals in the field to appear on the show. In addition, I hope to plan on inviting guest veterans to talk about their concerns and possibly offer solutions. As we navigate and work together through issues, we can all benefit. Please join me every Thursday at 1 p.m. for the Voice of the Veteran. Aloha! I can play, so any chance to play at all. You know, that's my life. I love music. Yeah, that's how we do it. So before the break, we were talking about the situation on the ground in Palestine that's given rise to the BDS movement, um, a nonviolent international protest against Israeli policy as it pertains to Palestinians. Now we're going to switch gears a little bit and talk about the reaction to BDS here in the United States, where the government is still um, uncritically pro-Israel. So recently in the news, there's been talk of a bill going through Congress, the Israeli Anti-Boycott Act which would criminalize um, organizations and individuals who wish to participate in the BDS movement, either through boycotting Israeli products or through divesting from Israeli companies or projects. 253 uh, representatives in the House, including our own Congresswoman Colleen Hanabusa, have co-sponsored that version, and 48 senators have co-sponsored the Senate version. The ACLU, however, uh, opposes the bill strongly. So can you explain a little bit more about what the bill would actually seek to do um, and why it's particularly dangerous for free speech? So the bill um, is kind of an amendment of a 1979 Export um, Administration Act. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of technical. But mm -hmm. basically what the bill does is it makes it um, punishable for businesses or individuals um, to be fined um, from anywhere from $250,000 up to a uh, million dollars and a year in prison for supporting the boycott. It's often called uh, a BDS bill, and in fact, I was struck at the town hall meeting mm -hmm. that Colleen Hanabusa referred to it as the BDS bill. Mm -hmm. It's not technically <laughs> a BDS bill in that what it says is that businesses that are supporting you know, kind of foreign entities or organizations that are calling for boycott of Israel, um, that you can't listen to them. You can't, you can't adhere to that boycott. Now, uh, what that means is, for example, let's say Kakul Market says, we're not going to stock Sabra Hummus mm -hmm. because Sabra Hummus violates the boycott, which it does. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, now, if uh, that means that they would be susceptible to these fines and um, to this to imprisonment. Mm -hmm. Now, if they said, we're not stocking Sabra hummus because we think it tastes bad, that would be cool. <laughs> and so this is actually punishing businesses and individual business owners because, of course, it is not businesses that go to prison. It's it is people, people mm -hmm. um, for their political beliefs. But that bill goes even further. And what that bill says is that any individuals who are inciting or you know, even finding out about or even inquiring about this are also punishable. So if I you know, call up Kakua Market and I say, well, which of your products are Israeli products and I'm not gonna buy those products and I don't think you should sell those products, that bill would allow me to be, that I would be, pen, you know, up, mm -hmm. I would be eligible for penalization mm -hmm. under that bill. So it, um, the reason the ACLU has come out so strongly against it is it is a direct infringement of First Amendment rights, and also, you know, the right to boycott is protected. You know, it is a protected and long respected form of free speech, and so the the ACLU has has taken a position against this, as have um, some Zionist Jewish organizations, including J Street. Hmm. And so there's, there's been some widespread resistance to this, but as you mentioned, there's also bipartisan congressional support mm -hmm. for this bill, and, that it, and it's, a, it's a very alarming bill. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. 
what, what does it say about, so essentially though, it, it's uh, seeking to criminalize or even perhaps outlaw the BDS movement because as you said, you can't even inquire about it. You can't even advocate on behalf of the BDS mm -hmm. movement or you're susceptible to these fines. So is that, is that correct? Yeah, I mean it's, okay, so like the EU has a list of products mm -hmm. that, they, that are made in the Palestinian territories and they have this list of products. They actually haven't even said don't buy them, but mm -hmm. it's a kind of implicit boycott, mm -hmm. call for boycott. Mm -hmm. So if you, as a business, boycott one of those, or if you, as an, uh, you know, an individual, put pressure on a business related to that, because the EU, as an international you know, entity, mm -hmm. has said, has put that, that up there, mm -hmm then even if you're not saying the EU called attention to this um, and that's why I'm interested, but even if you just yourself say, you know, this is, you know, this is something I'm interested in, mm -hmm. you are still subject mm -hmm. to penalization according to the lawyers who have looked at this very carefully, mm -hmm. including ACLU lawyers. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so that's part of the reason there's so much upset mm -hmm. around this bill. Mm -hmm. So, but the... So the Israel lobby is, is, like I said in the beginning, one of the most powerful in Washington. Mm -hmm. So what does it say about the fact that they're leveraging Congress so hard? Because they, they came out and sponsored this bill. They, they helped draft it, I believe, mm -hmm. um, IPAC in, in particular. What does it say about the state of things that they are um, so in, intent on making it difficult or, or in some ways outlawing the BDS movement in the US? Well, I think, to me, it speaks to the success and power of the BDS movement and the fact that you can't really stop it in any legitimate ways because it is nonviolent and it's grassroots and it is principled. It's basically a liberal movement. Uh, it's true that the results of it would be quite radical. Mm -hmm. But to say obey international law, mm -hmm. that's all it's doing. It's saying these three precepts of international law should be upheld. Mm -hmm. And so the fact that there is no really principled way, I think, to stop that leads to a kind of, I think we're seeing backlash right now. And, you know, Netanyahu, the Prime Minister of Israel, has declared BDS the largest strategic threat facing Israel. He has poured $25 million into stopping it, and um, Israel is very much working in tandem with Zionist groups in the U.S. to promote this kind of legislation. Uh, the IABA Act that we've been talking about is not the only such legislation. Some of it has passed. There have been about 26 states that mm -hmm. have passed some form mm -hmm. of legislation. And city level and as well. city think, level yeah. too. So this is part of a, a kind of panicked response, I think, to the fact that BDS has been working. There are companies that have been pulling out of um, their investments in Israel. And there are others that are scrambling right now and kind of figuring out what to do. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's it's both a sign of success, but also you know a kind of um, a kind of evidence I think of the fact that Israel is not a democratic state, and those supporting it are having trouble finding democratic ways to support what is not a democratic state. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So speaking of support for Israel. Um, last year, under the Obama administration, actually, uh, the United States and the Israeli government signed a $38 billion military mm -hmm. aid deal um, spread out over a decade. Um, so I want, I want to ask you how U.S. military money um, impacts or affects the situation on the ground in Palestine and what needs to change in order to, in, what needs to change in the United States policy or in terms of um, just social movements that, that needs to happen to change that situation on the ground? Well, I think it's very clear this has to be grassroots citizens mobilizing and saying no, because I think we see um, from every you know, administration, and now we have Kushner leading peace talks, mm. which is, um, I think, safely to say there's not gonna, that's not going to go anywhere. Um, and so it really is up to individuals to say to their representatives, this is actually, you know, this is not okay. We, we don't want this. Because I think unless there's this kind of pressure, it will continue. Uh, the $38 um, billion dollar aid packet is up from what was a $3 billion a year um, to $3.8 billion a year. What does that money do? That money creates a lot of misery. Um, 
Gaza is, is bombed approximately every two years. And 2014 was the last all-out assault on Gaza. Um, it, is, it is under the World Health Organization deemed to be unlivable by 2020. There is unsafe water. Um, they have rebuilt almost nothing from a ravaged infrastructure because there is blockade. Building materials cannot enter. People cannot enter in and out. It is the world's largest you know, outdoor prison. That is what the U.S. money is doing. It is supporting. It is supporting that. But it's also more complicated because Israel also uses Gaza and the West Bank as testing sites to develop weapons and surveillance technologies. There's a film called The Lab that talks about this, made by an Israeli uh, Jewish Israeli filmmaker. And so this, there's big money involved in this, and it's not just a us helping them mm -hmm, mm -hmm. kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Our police are trained mm -hmm. by Israel, and you know, which is. Part of the reason that Ferguson and Gaza had, a, you know, had a lot of exchange going mm -hmm. during the summer of 2014, when people in Gaza were like, "Oh, you know, we know what to do with this kind of tear gas. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. This is how you do this." Mm -hmm. And so I think that there is a lot of violence, basically, and we are supporting a violent occupation with that money. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is the short answer. Mm -hmm. So for viewers who are interested in pursuing this further, who are interested in learning more, who are interested in taking action to um, either or support the BDS movement or oppose legislation and policy, what can we do? Well, one thing um, in terms of this IABA Act is, is right to, you know, if you're in Hawaii, right to Colleen Hanabusa. Maybe she won't answer you as she has yet to answer me or any of the 20 people or so that I know of that have written to her. But it, but it's important that she listen to her constituency and at least know even if she is not going to answer to us. Mm -hmm. uh, more importantly, I think you can support the uh, U.S. campaign for the academic and cultural boycott of Israel and BDS. Um, and the BDS website gives um, more information about how to do that. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much, Cynthia. Thank you. Thanks for having me. In these times of national controversy about racial and religious bigotry, this show gives us a certain level of concern, especially in that it is taking place here in Hawaii. So, while we will allow these individuals to appear on ThinkTech, we advise you that the views they express do not in any way represent the views of ThinkTech or its management or staff. Further, to provide balance, we will be broadcasting a Community Matters show immediately after this show to address anti-Semitism on campus 2017. Please stay tuned to get that side of the story.